This is Preacher Casey getting killed by the vigilante man. Probably my favorite book, my favorite movie is uh, Steinbeck's Great of Wrath. It just shows how people, you know, just the common working man and his family, how, um, you know, they got to struggle and fight. This is a film about Mike Connor. Mike didn't show up today, so here I am, standing in. The effect isn't quite the same. But I'm gonna make this film anyway. That cut that, that's a cut, that's a personal thing, all right? Bullshit. Fucking lefty fucking liberals. World's fucked up, enjoy it. That's how I feel. Mike could be one of the greatest artists this world may never know, who tells the best stories the world might never hear. To me, his artwork is riveting, and when coupled with the stories behind them, the paintings are incredibly powerful. All right, shut the camera off, I'm tired. Perhaps Mike isn't sure that the world is ready for his genius. Phil, that's it. <laughs> Mike and about 40 other artists have their studios in this former textile mill. I decide to interview some of his friends and neighbors. Uh, my first impression was sort of like, uh, sort of a, 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 somebody like uh, Fred Flintstone, uh, who was uh, clearly uh, demented in some strange way. Mike's a very political guy. He's a very personal and intense guy, but... Um... It's, that's a hard one to say one word. I would say my, my Mike's a very intensely political guy, I guess. <laughs> or a politically intense guy, maybe. He feels like he has a mission. He can just, he does not paint to make pretty pictures or just to entertain the viewer. He's more, he has something to say in almost the shortest way possible. He does not try to kind of make his paintings pretty and add decorations to them. He just kind of say, this is about discrimination. So he just tried to get, to get the shortest cut to that expression. Because he's a self-taught artist, he does, not, he does not worry himself with if the colors match or if they're lighter or darker. It's just more about what I need to say here and how can people hear it. Well, I think I first met Mike when he came down to our studio. And he's a painter and I'm a painter and he had lights that he said he would give us and he set up some track lighting for us in our space and I thought that was really generous of him. Later on he offered us also some light spotlights. Like I said before, he's a union electrician. This is a guy with a career th that he has to function, well, at times not at such a high level because of the, the nature of how many times this fucking guy's been zapped. And he was zapped at several occasions, huge current going through his brain. And it was at that point, I think he started to create a lot of the work that, that was in the studio. I did the original track lighting in here, which still survived a couple renovations because I did such a good job. Yeah, this is a, a plaque that the <clears throat> Arts Alliance of uh, Haverstraw gave to me when I did the track lighting down there. November 98, after I finished it, was when I got the, my show because I told Alice Jane Bryant that I was painting. So she says, oh, you have to have a show. So I, I brought my paintings, one of my paintings, and she liked it. So this was where I had my first art show was in this gallery. And uh, it was where I had my, my first time that one of my pieces was a little on the controversial side. He very nicely to avoid the controversy, some Republican board member objected to that image of the flag. Instead of making it a point of free expression that kids could have it, 
you know, there were some uh, people were somewhat upset about this image. So Mike kind of felt to avoid controversy and avoid uh, the hard time for the woman who was in charge. He removed that piece from the show. It was like hanging right here on the wall, and it was a big piece. It was five by four, and I took it off the wall and I started taking it out to my truck. And she said, "No, no, no, don't take it out." She she didn't know what to do. She so I said, "Alex, we'll take it down and, and let's just be done with it." But I loved the part when she put it in the closet to show people. So when people would come in, she would slide the door open and show, and show the work to them. Naturally, I asked Mike to tell the story behind this painting. He, however, had a more important story to tell. Except they spelt my name wrong. I have a name. Like, I remember my, my eighth grade English teacher telling me that, like, like, who has the hardest name to spell in this room, right? And I knew just what he was getting at. And, you know, you have, like, my name's uh, Lisa Masterelli. And, you know, all these different names, like, you know, and everybody said, oh, no, it's my name. They said, no, it's Mike Connor's name. Well, anybody can spell Mike Connor. Well, he said, okay, everybody write down Mike Connor's name on a piece of paper and hand it in. So they all wrote it down. Well, you can spell Mike Connor, C-O-N-N-O-R. You can spell Mike Connor, C-O-N-N-O-R-S. People put Michael O'Connor. And then C O N N E R. There's like ten ways to spell my name in different variations, but it's just the E O and O. It's the E and the O. The E O of Connor. Like, you know, the E, they change the O and then they put the O in front. So now, you know, I don't, it, it bothers my mother like any time. So it never bothers me. Like, I, 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 I've had my name spelt so many times. I've had art shows where they even spelt my name wrong. They put Connor with an O. So it's E R O R. Whatever, O'Connor, O'Connors, they put the S on, you know, so whatever, I don't care. But it is, really, really it's C-O-N-N-E-R. In spite of Mike's reluctance, I learned that in 2000, Mike took this painting and brought it to an event at St. Mark's Church in New York. Father Julio Torres immediately recognized this image of Archbishop Romero. Soon after, Mike was commissioned to paint these two murals. I commissioned this painting because um, early on in um, 2000, we started thinking about uh, dedicating this chapel to Martin Luther King Jr. and Archbishop Romero. Uh, the reason being that they are both prophets of the people in different parts of the American continent. Many, many people were, were murdered by the military dictatorship in El Salvador, the estimate is 100,000. I learned from Father Torres that Archbishop Romero condemned the military dictatorship and was assassinated while giving mass on March 24, 1980. Then I asked Mike about the Martin Luther King mural. I mean, I'm not going to give a history lesson on Martin Luther King. Either you know who he is or you're brain dead in America. I mean, yeah, he gets at hostile. You know, I'm sure there's people down south, you know, racist people that don't, that, that don't like him, that are totally into white supremacy. Very angry, and I think, I think it's reflected in the work itself. America's divided between black and white people. There's a, there's a major divide in this country. Is it when he's drinking? Or smoking, or whatever it is. Or if he's not getting laid, I think that has an effect on him. Maybe I was making Mike feel that uncomfortable. Cut, that, that's a cut, that's a I decided thing. to bring a mutual right. friend. Thank you. Tanya has known Mike for about three years and also loves his paintings. I figured she would help Mike loosen up and maybe get him to talk about his artwork. Yeah, so I, I don't want to stand. I want to sit down. Well, sit down there. I don't want to sit. I want to sit over here. All right, just sit this up. Those guys stay. Let's sit here. <laughs> sit over here. I feel a lot more comfortable. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a sucker when I walk down the street and, I, you know, some homeless guy bumming for a buck, you know. I'll give him a buck. <laughs> You know, I, I I'm talking know. about something more, you know, something that you do all the time, over and over again. No. Help homeless kittens. No. I, tutor somebody to read. No. Be a big brother. No. Okay. It's not, you know, it's like, you know, with surviving, working, cleaning, cooking. Commuting into the city, working, it's kind of hard, you know, I mean, I'm not... But that everybody could say. Everybody cooks, cleans, commutes. Well, yeah, no, but some people got it pretty easy. I do hard physical work. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, I'm exhausted, you know, compared to somebody, you know, that takes a nice air-conditioned train and, you know, goes up to the 51st floor. What are you working you know? on now? Where are you working? I'm not working right now. No. no. I ended up being oh, wrong. No. 
Mike didn't open up, and I figured these were the yeah. hurdles that all filmmakers encountered. Yeah, I couldn't expect work. Mike to be interesting every time I turned the camera on. They kind of like, each one is, is kind of like a, a different experiment in, in, in painting, you know, like you try to get the different feel for them. Also, painting for me, I find it, it's, it's kind of fun, you know, like you're creating um, different, I don't know, it's just like sometimes you can like get a moment, you just get lost. I mean, I can paint and like I turn around and four hours disappeared and, you know, uh, like marathon painting. <laughs> I thought I was signing up for Diego Rivera. Instead, yeah. here was Bob Ross. Like maybe if I kept rolling, Mike would talk about his happy little trees and maybe paint some pudgy little bushes. About a third of Mike's art is rooted in labor history, as if haunted by these distant events. Pier 38 depicts dock workers striking in 1934. This painting shows mine workers who were abandoned in the desert during the 1917 Arizona copper mine strike. Mike's incredible ability to tell these stories verbally and visually explains why on April 30th, 2004, he was invited to a labor history conference in Patterson, New Jersey. I was excited and knew that Mike couldn't avoid talking about his artwork and that I would be there to capture it. I even hired a professional camera operator. I didn't want to miss a thing. Mike. Mike, what? please don't leave. I will have some people no, 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 no. Come on, don't do she this. She already to me. set it up. I don't care what she set up. You are I mean, a presenter. You know, will you please I'm, I'm give me a minute? Yeah, this is like a carnival. Mike. You know how I feel? This is like the second Mike, time. Mike, please this calm is it. down. This I will is get it. you set up, okay? No, no, I'm out of here, Jeanette. Why are you doing that? Because it's bullshit. It's like they gotta push set up their fucking carnival for their freaking African drum shit. And it's labor history and I'm please a serious labor Please don't do history. this. I will get it taken down, but you, please give me a minute. You got here you late, know? I got here late. Yeah. Let's figure it out, all right? Give me a second. No, it's not you personally, I know but it's, it's just, not. It's just it's bullshit. Fucking bullshit. Fucking lefty fucking liberals. They can't even fucking order no shit. Okay, I'll move it. No, no, no. I'll move it. No, 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 no. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It was a close call, but we were back on track. With two cameras pointed at Mike, we couldn't possibly miss a thing. Again, I was wrong. Middle of filming, this kid runs in and says, Somebody busted your fucking window. So here we are. The aftermath of the busted window. Yeah, I got the cops coming. So they got my lights. My cell phone in the car. My journal for no reason, full of my phone numbers. My microphone in the car. Take the radio. Another bag, my CD, CD player. We waited two hours for the police and missed Mike's lecture. We later heard that Mike was captivating. I brought Tanya and her friend Chris to an event at Mike's complex. Open studio days held once a year and allows tenants to show their artwork to the public. I wanted to see what Chris would think about Mike and his artwork and was hoping that a new face would put Mike in a talkative mood. I didn't go to art school. I don't know theory of art. I don't, you know, I just do it. I graduated from Harvard. Most art people are, and most academic people are assholes anyway. And after I graduated, I came to New York, went to, was in the Whitney Independent Study Program for a year. I have big contempt for most you know, well-educated, upper-crusty, you know, jerk-offs, basically. Yeah, yeah. Back to Hunter, got a master's in fine arts at Hunter. It's all about money, you know, the art world. He may be more clever than he's letting on. You know, he may have, he may have realized that it's to his advantage to come across as sort of a, 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 sort of a more naive person. He seemed to be having a difficult, sort of a tough time today because, well, I think it is a tough time. For one thing, his... Uh, He's not in the best location. I should be trying to sell some art to people. You know, you think so? Yeah. Does anybody want to buy art? <laughs> huh? It was sort of interesting because his studio, I mean the main studio was, uh, was dark because he wanted to show his Frankencorn installation, you know, to its best effect. 
And I think that some people were just scared off. Before, man, it was like maybe ten in a row. They'd go in. I figured they watched it for one revolution. The girl would be looking, and she wants to go in, but the guy's going this way. She's going this way. Going back and forth. He should have had some kind of a statement as to what he was doing on the wall, because I think it was the con. People couldn't necessarily figure out where this stuff was coming from or what it was supposed to be about. It definitely draws your attention to keep staring at it. I'm not sure what I'm looking at, but I just keep, want to keep looking. Uh, I think he's found himself as an artist more than, than most of the people whose work we saw up there. I think most of those people are creating stuff according to what they think they should be doing. In a way, he reminds me of like Diego Rivera, somebody like that. And there was a certain kind of, uh, I won't say naivete, certainly, because Diego Rivera was not naive, but a certain kind of intensity of vision. Chris Zeller was happily surprised by Mike's artwork. He felt that Mike's talent, if discovered, would put him on the throne of the outsider art world. Outsider art is art created by untrained people outside the art establishment. Mike and his paintings fit into this category. Buddha, Jesus, and Mary, you know, the Trinity. And then I got my picture here, you know. I'm a Dalai Lama or something. <laughs> I just like the iconology, you know, of like the different putting together on one altar, I don't know. Um, the way I kind of like, I just took all these different images and things I had, but I, I put the army soldiers in and like, this is kind of like a, an altar for war, you know, like the reality of it, you know, this is like, you know, inside the soldier's mind, you know, that's, I kind of built that, you know, like the prison of war, like we're, you know, this, it's like embedded in our culture. Yeah, it looks like it's got more cooch in it than army men. Well, is it more sexual? I guess to you? It represents, like, uh, the evildoers. <laughs> I mean, women what? and little plastic soldiers? Yeah. It's nice it's... the way you set women up as being as evil as war. You know, I don't know what Freud would say about this and your feeling about women. At this point, I needed some professional help. You know, when Freud, with Freud, Freud, when he first uh, developed this thing called psychoanalysis, uh, his, uh, he saw as problematic was uh, sexual uh, impulses. Each one of these, you know, the women are isolated, they're alone, they seem far away. They seem uh, foreign to him. Uh, they're, you know, he's drawn to them but he can't, he can't understand them, he can't get inside them, they're external, he's uh, there over there, I'm over here, uh, but there's some pull toward him. I, li I like these paintings, I'd like to have one on my wall. <laughs> Ronald Lieber didn't help explain why Mike wouldn't talk about his art, except his theory that women are foreign to Mike may explain this five minute tirade directed towards Tanya and that aggressive interviewing approach I hadn't yet tried. You know, I'm just gonna be honest with you, so like, to get into it, like, you know, what, what does this piece mean? It's, it's a naked chick dancer, that's all. And you, you put them all the fuck together and drink a couple beers and that's what the fuck it means. It don't have a means. I don't have to take everything and put it to a fucking, you know, some type of uh, 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 like, like academic, what does it mean? It means shit. What's life mean? Life means shit. We're put on this earth and we all struggle to do something and that's what it fucking means. You know, it's not this, I'm not sitting, you know, with, with the intellectual what does it mean shit. You read half the fucking art magazines, it's a bunch of intellectuals jerking off. That's all. So that's what it means, Tanya. Is that what you want? You love to press the button and you get me. All right? I want you to describe well, well, how do, how do I describe? I don't know how to do it. it. It is what it is. It's visual stuff. It's all these little paintings that I put together. You know, I came out here, drank a few beers or wine, and, and I did it, that's all. You know, and I put the symbolism, the army, you know, little army men, war, cops, you know, women, violence, sex, jail. I mean, you know, it's what it is. It's the image, do you understand the images? You know, you look, you watch the TV, and you see what the fuck's on TV. This is what it is, it is what it is. You always gotta dissect it, and this is what it is, and you dissect it left, right. Who gives a fuck? The world's fucked up, enjoy it. That's how I feel. Dude, she ain't coming no more. That's it. 
Any more filming? I should do some tiny things. You know? I'm telling you, I don't want her around. In the middle of open studio day, Mike left his own studio unattended. I followed him to another part of the complex. Like hammering me. What does it mean? What does it mean? And so I said, well, come on. I'm going to go around and ask artists, what's it mean? Nobody knows it. You just do it. There she is. She's coming. She's coming to get me. Money. All right. You know, like they want to know the meaning and the intellectual, you know. Like money. Money. Okay. Good. Thank you. Another that was my favorite uh, idiot savant doing. Good, man. <laughs> What's that, savant? Idiot savant. What's that? Uh, come on, you use uh, big words on I know, I'm just I'll break it down for you. I'll break it down for you. Break it down. Come on, it's your like time's running it's out. It's like an oxymoron, you know? You understand oh, okay. what that is? Yeah, all right. It's an, I'm just an oxymoron. You're, right. an, you're an oxymoron. Okay, you're, well, you're, cool. more of, cool. you're more of a... Um, Moron? No, no. You're more of like uh, <laughs> an acronym. Oh, okay. After open studio day, I figured that the artwork would have to speak for itself. I didn't think Mike had any interest in allowing me to capture his stories on camera. I went to his studio and photographed over 50 of his paintings. on himself. He does whatever he wants. Not sort of, a lot of the art world is very constrained, really. You know, there's sort of the notion of what is good art or bad art or well-rendered art. And uh, Mike doesn't bother himself with any of that stuff. So he can be free. It's a nice day out today. Fine day for an art show. Um, yeah, it's nice. I had some of my friends stop by and, uh, you know, being in August, it's a little slow, but you know it's a yeah, slower opening than I expected. But it's pretty cool, you know. Hey, you going, big hey. superstar? Hey, hey, take care, man. You got Thanks. lipstick on you. Watch that. After yeah. Mike's art show, I knew it was time to stop filming. I took the month of August off to assemble the footage. Instead, I sat on the couch to heal my scratched eye. By the third week of September, I had cobbled together the first rough cut of my film. I showed it to my friends and family to get some feedback. You know, I have to wonder if a sculptor who's sculpting out of a pile of crap feels the same way and, and then realizes at the end all it is is a well-shaped pile of crap. Um, this wasn't well-shaped. It should have became a movie about, you know, documentary. About him. I mean, if it was a documentary about you, somebody else would be making it. I mean, what do you make? A, 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 a doc guy's making a documentary about himself? I mean, what the hell planet are you on? You don't get the story across from you narrating. I need him to tell me personally. Make him talk, okay? My impact at the end, which I guess isn't an initial impact, was where's the story? You know, why should I care? Um, I mean, I don't know what all the criticism is about. You know, I thought the film had some great sound on it. Seriously. Uh, I mean, you could hear the voices were clear and crisp. I stopped editing for a few days and decided to build a wall in my garden. I now had less than two weeks to meet my self-imposed deadline and get back to my carpentry business. I had endless conversations with everyone I had screened the movie for and the consensus was in. They really liked the wall. All the footage I shot, assembled in any which way, could never convey the power of Mike's art. Seven months of filming, 20 hours of footage, one robbery and less one eye and it took a pile of rocks to help me see the obvious. It, it, it is, is what it is. is. Visual stuff. It's all these little paintings that I put together. You know, I came out here. I went to visit Mike without my camera and, and just recorded his voice. What I call this, it's Mommy Nostas Matando. It's Mommy, they're killing us. And uh, that's uh, in El Mazuto, one of the women that survived. She hid in the, in the bushes and watched as her children were killed and she can remember them yelling out, you know, Mami no estas matando, is, Mami they're killing us and uh, they killed 900 women and children. 
that day in uh, El Salvador and uh, it shows like you know what America with its uh, imperial powers you know does in South America and we basically we fund the killing. The School of Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, it's where uh, training all the uh, policemen and soldiers and from South America and some of the worst atrocities that uh, have happened have been by graduates of the School of Americas. Mm -hmm.